All right, now we're going to go to chapter three, the respect for the truth objection. And basically, this objection is saying that uh, um, the Pascal's wager doesn't sufficiently uh, respect the truth. I mean, that's what, what it's called. Uh, but it's going to, it's it's actually um, maybe two objections into one. So um, he starts off on page 55 asking you to consider. Um, you know, suppose you were offered ten thousand dollars to believe the first person to set foot on Australia was left-handed. Now, uh, I mean, well, he says you would have two thoughts. One, you can't just believe, and number two, there's something um, intellectually messed up about that, intellectually wrong, I guess, um, and probably because you're not really believing on the basis of evidence. Okay, um, okay, now. Um, so that's that's two points, uh, and uh, you can make those same sorts of objections to Rhoda's wager. Now Rhoda's uh, response is uh, well, okay. Let's let's deal with one at a time. So number one is um, uh, you might say you can't just choose to believe in God, and then number two, even if you could, that would be bad. That would be intellectually self-deceiving or messed up. Okay, so let's choose the first one. And you guys are familiar with that from uh, Schellenberg's argument, right? Um, as uh, Schellenberg suggests, we can't choose our beliefs, and we discussed that in class quite a bit. Okay, so Rhoda's response to that is pretty simple. Um, and this is at the bottom of the handout, if you're uh, filling it in, the bottom of the first page, which is, yeah, he, uh, he agrees we can't choose our beliefs. But we can choose certain lifestyles, and that's what his decision table is about. His dis the two the strategies in his decision table are uh, choosing to commit to living a Christian life. It's not choosing to believe. Um, so he's like that. That's fine. Okay, so that's response number one. Pretty straightforward. Okay. Now the second objection says there's something intellectually disrespectable or self-deceiving. I think uh, one of you uh, wrote unnatural um, in your email uh, so some, something bad about it and it's a little unclear what that is um, but one thing Rhoda draws attention to and this is on page 56 is this is not this argument's not aimed at uh, people who are atheists people who disbelieve or believe disbelieve in God or believe that there is no God this is for people who think Christianity is at least 50 percent uh, likely okay so in that case that lowers the self-deception okay and uh, that's the basic gist of um, his response that I see. And then the strategy is he doesn't have to, he's not saying like, oh, you know, make yourself believe. I mean, if, if you remember how he defined committing to living the uh, Christian life in chapter two, it was things like pray, you know, and the prayer could be like, God, if you exist, then, you know, or it could be like attending church, you know, reading uh, and, and being involved with um, with. Christian activities like that. So, uh, I mean, in that sense, you don't really have to do anything self-deceiving. I mean, you could even let people know that uh, um, you don't really believe the stuff, that you're um, open, you're, uh, don't, uh, you don't actually um, accept everything to be true. Okay, so, um, so on that note, um, I think I would add one additional thing that Rhoda doesn't talk about. William James talks about uh, um, two goals for uh, in epistemology okay and this is a basically an epistemological or epistemic objection right like believing when you don't have evidence um that's that's a, there's something epistemically bad so one thing Rhoda, or sorry one thing william james noted is there's two goals um in our epistemic life epistemological life which is to believe truths and to not believe falsehoods okay now if you care too much about one of those goals then things go awry so without caring about the other goal. So suppose you only care about believing truths, but you don't care about not believing falsehoods. Then you might as well just believe everything, right? Even things you might think are false to, in some extent, to, in some way. Um, and then that'll be your maximal chance of believing all the truths. Um, or if your only goal is to resist believing falsehoods, but you don't care about believing truths, then you should just never believe in anything, right? Okay, um, and that'll maximize your chance of, of, of uh, um, not believing a falsehood. Just don't believe anything. Then you'll surely not believe any falsehoods.
But, you know, if we want to live the proper intellectual life, you got to follow both, right? Um, I think that's one of the problems with skepticism. Skeptics are so concerned about avoiding falsehood that they're going to miss out on believing any truths. Okay, so you want to do a little bit of both. And in this case, notice the, the chance of uh, Christianity being true is at least 50% likely. So, uh, I mean, that's not so bad. Like you're helping yourself reach this goal of, uh, of believing the truth. All right, so I just wanted to throw that in there. And uh, now next. Um, okay, now uh, next on the handout. Uh, okay, there's one more objection. And I ask, what is the Mac versus PC analogy? Now, um, I didn't understand this because Macs are clearly superior, but anyway, um, he says, apparently there's some psychological studies that when you choose to commit something, or let's say people who bought a Mac or bought a PC, right, um, those people uh, tend to, like, after choosing it, they tend to start finding reasons to think, ah, this is the better one. Um, one of uh, one of you wrote in your email, it's... it's um, uh, it's a confirmation bias, uh, the, the, or that's what one of you suggested. Um, okay, and so here's how uh, committing to live the Christian life could be self-deceiving or instance of confirmation bias, which is that in choosing to live the Christian life and maybe that resulting in your belief, it's not intellectually responsible um, in the same way that believing that a Mac is superior um, uh, just because you chose it, that, that doesn't seem to be uh, epistemologically or intellectually right. Now, I think the Macs are better. But anyway, we'll put that aside. Um, I think Rhoda says, yeah, I think as far as I understood Rhoda's response on pages 56 to 57, he agrees, yeah, that, that might happen. I think his general response is to say that's not so bad. And he uses the example with the, um, the long-lost brother who's, who um, might have got kidnapped. Um, and you get the letter saying, you know, he, like asking for updates, but he will never reply um, to the letters. It's, it's kind of a far-fetched example, but you know, let's, let's, you know, take it for what we can. And, um, and he says, you know, suppose it's only 50% likely that this is true. Um, that your brother is indeed cannot, this is really happening. Shouldn't you still um, write these letters? And and Rhoda thinks, yeah, you should, <laughs> you know? Um, and so um, now it's true that by writing these letters, it might even lead you by the way of this, you know, confirmation bias or whatever, that it might even lead you to start uh, believing that your brother exists, but it's worth it, you know, if the, the, for these, um, Benefits outweigh the costs, and that's what uh, that's what Rhoda's argument is all about. You know, maximizing expected utility or expect good. Um, so I think I think ultimately he's going to say, yeah, it could lead to confirmation bias, but it's worth it because of the benefits over the costs, expected benefits over expected costs. And uh, number two, just a reminder, like this is for the somebody, the person who thinks that Christianity is at least fifty percent likely. Um, so it's not such a bad chance of getting uh, a false belief. All right, so that's respect for the truth. Uh, one more video coming up, and. Hmm.